Hey everybody, this is Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff. So I have this little story. I ordered this phone and I got it in the mail recently. I waited over a month for this crazy phone. This phone, which I am speaking about right now, a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's called the Nexus 4 and what I'm going to be doing today is a real in-depth review that talks about the real-world use of this phone, all its applications. Is it a phone that's actually good for you? What are the good points? What are the bad points? And generally, I just want to be as honest as possible, especially on certain aspects that people have brushed over or aspects that people have just missed entirely about this particular phone. So let's get into it. It's gonna be super in depth. So that means that I'm going to be time coding this review. If you've seen some of my reviews in the past, you'd probably know that they're about an hour long and it's full chalk packed of information. And if you don't have time to watch the entire review, you can go to the description and you'll see that there is topic by topic by topic. You can click on anything that you want to see so that you can personalize your experience with this video. If you don't have time to watch the whole thing, you can pick whatever it is that you want to see and then you can come back later or you can watch the entire thing if you'd like to. I'd love that as well. So let's go and see what the Nexus 4 is capable of, shall we? Now the first obvious question is probably going to be the pricing and the overall value of the phone. I have the 16 gigabyte model. There's something that you want to keep in mind when you're choosing these phones. Yeah, there's two different prices, which are really awesome. I have to admit you're contract free. You can do whatever it is you want without having to be bound to a stupid carrier, especially now when there's been that law passed in the United States that says, oh, it's illegal to unlock phones. Well, you know what? It just makes the Nexus 4 that much more attractive because it comes unlocked. So for $299, you have the 8 gigabyte model and for $349, which is $50 more, you have the 16 gigabyte model. The thing that I think people need to pay attention to is the particular memory that's actually available on these two phones. Even though this phone is 16 gigabytes, you have to pay attention to the memory that has been allocated to the system. So in all actuality, this has about 13 gigabytes of available storage on the phone. So if you think about the 8 gigabyte model, that drops down to about 5 gigabytes of storage that's available to the phone. So really pay attention there. It might actually be worth the extra $50 to chip in for the 16 gigabyte model. If you look at other phones today, like the HTC One X or the Galaxy S3 or every other popular phone I can think of has 16 gigabytes of storage on board. Also, there is no ability to expand the storage, so that 16 gigabyte may be just what you need. Let's get into build quality. I actually was very happy with the build quality. I've been hearing a lot of things that, oh, this phone is cheap, oh, this phone is this or that, but I actually really do like the build quality of this phone. It feels very stable and sturdy in the hand. Let's go take a closer look at it. In the hand, the Nexus 4 actually feels pretty spiffy, especially because when I creak it and try to bend it this way, nothing happens. There is no type of feeling that lets me to believe that this is a low quality phone, which is quite awesome. The sides of this phone are made up of this rubbery touch type plastic feel, which makes it feel nice in hand in a way that makes it so I don't feel like I'm going to drop it. That's something that its predecessor, the Galaxy Nexus, had something that I didn't quite like is that it was all plastic and it did kind of feel kind of slippery except for this mat on the back. But instead, that nice feeling has graduated to the sides and I really don't feel that I'm going to drop this phone while I am holding it. The rest of the sides of this phone are covered with the chrome-like plastic. It looks quite a bit like metal, although I'm pretty positive it's plastic. It's held up pretty well to damage like scratches, except for when it flew across my lap in my car and it kind of hit the center console. You can see that there's a small ding right there in the plastic, but overall I don't see much damage to this. It does hold fingerprints and it does hold dust in here, but it seems to be holding up fairly well this far. This brings me to a warning about the glass back that we have on here. Because it's glass, it's very slick, and I said that it had slipped off my lap and hit the center console in my car. That happened because the glass is slick. Slick is glass, glass is slick. So that means if you set it on something like cotton, like cotton jeans, cotton pants, whatever, polyester, I don't know what it is you wear, but it's going to slide off of any surface if there's any amount of force to make it fall, whether that be gravity or you jerking your car. So I recommend getting a case for this because you don't want to damage the glass back and you certainly don't want to break the screen. 
This phone also has quite a bit of trouble with uneven surfaces. So you can see it's just sitting on here and if this was at any type of incline, it's just going to fall straight off. So if you're somebody who's sitting around drinking beer with your buddies and you like to set your phone sitting on your nice armchair, it's probably not the greatest place for it because as soon as you move, it's going to fall into the floor, you're going to cry. Yeah, don't, don't do it. Get a case to protect this puppy. Another reason to protect this is this is actually not Gorilla Glass. The front is Gorilla Glass 2, the back. It's been shown in reports now that this is not Gorilla Glass. I believe it still is a tempered glass because industry standard, when you do have any type of glass, is to temper it in some way, whether that is heat or a chemical tempering, just so that it's not dangerous if it does crack. But this will crack fairly easily. A lot of people are reporting that it does crack. And I've taken actually a pin to this in a very discreet area and started scratching at it. And I noticed that, of course, it scratched much easier than it did on the front. There was no mark on the front with the same exact amount of pressure exerted. And it easily scratched the back, so definitely not Gorilla Glass. I believe it is still some type of a hardened glass, just as per industry standards. But, eh, get a case, get a case, get a case, get a case! Now for me, I absolutely love this glass back and that glittery ball effect. Since this isn't Gorilla Glass and this does scratch fairly easily, what I've noticed is that this glittery effect has actually prevented scratches from being too apparent. But if you're a person who's not a fan of cases or screen protectors, even though this is getting scratched fairly easily, it's very hard to detect the scratches with this glittery effect. As for your important phone pieces, you've got the volume rocker here on the left hand side. On your right hand side, you've got a power button. I like the placement of this power button, especially because I'm used to using a lot of Galaxy line phones. We have the Galaxy Note 2 here. You can see that as they're both on the side, the problem with the Galaxy line of phones is that the button is so close to where your thumb will hit naturally that it's easy to turn the phone on and off. So your power button is still easy to press and to reach, but you're not sitting and pressing it all the time. You've got your receiver right here, you've got your front-facing camera. On the bottom here you have a notification LED which goes off every several seconds. On the top here you've got a recording microphone which is used for things even like when you're speaking on speakerphone. This is the microphone that's used for that even when you are speaking on Skype. This is also the microphone used for that. The other microphone is the one that's used strictly for the phone which is on the bottom here. This is your voice call microphone. You've got a micro USB port down here and holding the phone together is just these two screws which are like a Torx 6 or something. Since this phone does not have an interchangeable battery, it is all one piece, you do have a SIM tray slot that's on the side of the phone rather than being able to pop off the back and get to it underneath the battery and pull out the SIM. You actually need some type of a SIM ejection tool. What I found interesting is that this is Probably one of the smallest little holes that I've seen for a SIM ejection tool. So small that my other standard type of ejection tools don't work. I suggest using something like a pin. This is just like a sewing pin or something, but you take it, you know, a needle will do just fine. Make sure that you've got a steady grip on it. That's why I recommend a pin that has one of these little bobbers on it. Go ahead, press down, pops out very easy, and voila, there you go. One thing that is fantastical about this phone is it does just fine with SIM adapters. This is a nano SIM to micro SIM adapter. Go ahead and push this in. All you need to do in order to get this in place is just to make sure by holding with your thumb here that it's going in correctly. Go ahead and guide it and then just simply shove it down. Fits in there perfectly. You're not going to have any trouble with it getting stuck or ruining your phone in any way. But if you do do something weird and break your phone, don't come crying to me and saying it was my fault. The complaint that I do have with the build quality actually has to do with the micro USB port. Now watch this, listen to this. I'm going to try to be as quiet as possible. I'm going to go ahead and plug this guy in here. That's not so good. It literally sounds to me like you have the motherboard just sitting there and the micro USB port is sitting here without anything keeping it anchored so that when you bend it, it's making that noise. I'm not exactly sure if that is the true problem with this, but that sounds just a little bit cheap. Anytime you plug it in or you move it around, you're gonna hear that. Instead of it being nice and reassuring, it's a little bit, I, 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 I don't know. That should not be that way. Now getting on to a size comparison, we're also going to be doing a pocket test, woo, to see how it fits in my jeans so you can figure out realistically if the Nexus 4 
will be your next pocket buddy. But here we have three phones. We have the Galaxy Note 2, we have the Nexus 4, and an iPhone 5. Itty bitty, sad iPhone 5. But you can see here that the Nexus 4 is a pretty decent sized phone. I don't feel like this is a huge phone by any means. They do manage to keep this phone relatively thin, especially because that battery is locked in there. So here we have the Nexus 4 next to the Galaxy S3, which is incredibly popular, and a lot of people have held this in hand, so it might be a good one to compare it to. So I know that my Galaxy S3 looks all kinds of confused right now, especially with the back being white plastic, and the glass being this red color, and on top of it is this screen protector, which is glass by iLoom, but nonetheless, this is a Galaxy S3, I promise. See, ta-da! So Nexus 4 next to Galaxy S3. In terms of size, the only thing that I notice really is that the Galaxy S3 is a little bit longer. In terms of the width, I think they're pretty much matched. Yeah, check that out. Popular phone sandwich. So yes, about the exact same width. The height on the Galaxy S3 is just a little bit bigger and the corners are less rounded on the Nexus 4. By thickness, the Nexus 4 is just a tiny bit thicker than the Galaxy S3, but honestly, both of them are just as easily pocketable, and that added thickness on the Nexus 4 is not something that I'm noticing all that much in hand. This should give you a good idea of overall size between the Note 2 and the Galaxy Nexus and the iPhone 5. There you are. This is where it stacks up between all these babies. All right, pocket test with the Nexus 4. So I'm going to slide this into my girl jeans and I've also got a guest star here today who's going to be demonstrating the male jean pocket test. So you can see that the Nexus 4 is, of course, glass on front and back. That's a little bit concerning because it can slip very easily on just about any surface. What's nice, though, is since it does have a little bit of a soft touch type rubber on the side, when you put it into your pocket, at least it's catching the jeans enough to feel secure. So that's a plus. You can see that it comes up fairly high here. When I sit, sometimes I'll take it out, but I can get away with it. Although in male jeans, which we're going to demonstrate, it's really not so bad. So here we have my own Mr. Francois, and he's going to be taking the Nexus 4 and putting it into his pocket. So it is still quite visible in his pocket, but unlike mine, at least it fits in there entirely. He is complaining a little bit, though, that it feels like it's a little bit too angular for his pocket in a way that's uncomfortable. So we have the Galaxy S3 here, and you can see the difference of the embossment. So it's a little bit less noticeable with the S3. The Nexus 4 is really not all that terrible. That's just one thing to keep in mind, is it's... It's okay in pocket, it's not a large phone by any means, but it's maybe not as comfortable as some other phones. So for the display here, we have a 4.7 inch. This is an IPS display. It's covered with Gorilla Glass 2, as I had mentioned earlier. The resolution is a little bit wider than standard 720p. It's actually 1280 by 768. That gives you 320 pixels per inch, which is really nice in terms of resolution. Yo, Jenna, you can actually see in the YouTube video that it's actually not too many pixels that have been cut off, even though this isn't 16.9. Oh, nice cleavage. Even though the Nexus 4 has an aspect ratio that's wider than either of something like the iPhone 5 or the Galaxy Note 2, I've actually really liked it because when playing games, it seems that you have more of a screen real estate. This is one of my favorites for right now, putting monsters. I feel that expanding this display was actually well needed because you can see that you're actually cutting off some of the pixels at the bottom. This is actually for software buttons instead of any type of hardware buttons. So even though in some applications you're still cutting off a bit of the screen because those software buttons don't go away, I think admittedly for gameplay it does quite nice with the bigger screen ratio. It's kind of like having an iPad versus an Android tablet that has a 16.9 resolution. Maybe movies look better on the 16.9 tablet, but a lot of applications look really great at this type of aspect. During video though, you really have nothing to worry about because you can see that those software buttons actually hide themselves and you get the full range of the display. One thing that I particularly like about this screen and playing games on this device is the fact that you can actually hold the device while you're playing games. Just say you're playing a fast moving car game. You don't have to worry about accidentally touching any buttons. Yes, you need to be worried about these software buttons, but it's nice that you have something to hold on to. The same goes for when you're watching movies. It just feels like I'm not going to be pushing on any kind of buttons or disturbing the experience, so that's quite nice. If I was to do the exact same thing on the Galaxy Note 2, I could accidentally touch one of the capacitive buttons, like the back button, or I could touch the menu button, and that just gets kind of irritating sometimes, so I really appreciate 
the fact that I can hold on to this guy here without interrupting anything. So now let's get into display colors and calibration because this is very important to a lot of people with their phone display. This display has a lot of potential. So let's get into the good things. I've done some measurements. This phone has a near full sRGB gamut, which means it can display a full range of colors with really nice saturation. Also, there isn't weird things going on with the saturation, so that's also really a good thing. What makes this display really nice for watching movies is that it has a really nice contrast ratio, which means that blacks are actually really black. And also, if you have black bars in movies, you won't be disturbed by them because they're actually black. They kind of mix with the bezel and it becomes really unnoticeable. So that is really a good quality to have in this type of display. Now, of course, I have to play devil's advocate and I need to talk about the bad things with this display so that people can make an informed decision if this is really important to you. Number one is that the viewing angles aren't so good. I found out this is actually typical of displays that have a really nice contrast ratio is that they tend to not have very good viewing angles. Some people may not mind that and that's great. So just keep that in mind. You may be wondering why I've been holding up this gradient here this entire time. This is kind of important. Check this out. This is supposed to be pure white all the way down to pure black. So in a gradient, it's supposed to be very smooth and gradual all the way down. Do you see these bands here? Do you see how it looks black, then blue, then green, then I don't know what color, still don't know what color, and looks like white? Yeah, there's something really weird going on here with the gamma. I don't know why they did this. So starting with the highlights or your whites right here, they just don't look right. I don't know how to quite describe it, but it's just, it's not so good. You get a lot of solarizing, you get a lot of burning in whites, so it's eh, not so good. Then you go downward towards your midtones here. It's actually too blue at this point. Midtones are usually faces, skin tones. So people, if you're going on a website that you see a lot of faces, you'll notice that people kind of look like zombies. They kind of look sick. They just look too blue. Something's not quite right. So you can go and check out The Verge on this display or CNN or anywhere else where you're going to see a lot of faces. You're going to see that people just look, just look dead. It doesn't look right. Now, as you go downward, 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 you're going to have not enough blue in places and suddenly it's too blue and then suddenly it's black. Why? Why? It could be so nice. So just say that you were watching a night scene or something that's not perfectly black. You're going to see there's black in areas and suddenly it looks blue. You're like, whoa, what is that? That's not supposed to be there. You might end up being disturbed sometimes by what you're seeing. Things just may not look quite right. Some people may get used to it over time and they won't care. But for me, it just ruins the experience of what could be a really nice display. Why did you do this? Sorry, Charlie, to have to use you as an example, but here we have a good idea of what I'm seeing with the blues and the blacks and there being too much blue once it starts getting to your shadows. So this is supposed to be all black. It's not perfectly black so that you're seeing all of a sudden, bam, blue. So just imagine night scenes. You're going to see this probably a lot where things just suddenly don't look right. There are programs that do try to fix this. There's faux clock. That's one of the applications. But honestly, if you're not able to take a color emitter and measure what you're looking at, there's no point in that type of application because you might just make it worse. It might look good to your own general taste and that might be enough for people. But the gamma, it's well, that's what it is. It's just, it's all wrong. The curve is just bleh. This has Jelly Bean, the latest Jelly Bean, 4.2.1. That is the thing that is the most awesome about the Nexus line of devices. You're going to be getting the newest operating system that comes out by Google, and you're going to be getting it the soonest. So that's fantastic. I want to show you all the new features of Jelly Bean and what it does for this phone. Photosphere I'm going to be covering in great depth. I'll be pushing that over to the photo section, but that's, this is, I love having the updates before everybody else, and maybe you do too, and that's the reason why we all love Nexus. The first thing that I must say about the Nexus 4 and Jelly Bean is just how insanely fast this is. This is probably the fastest that I feel I've seen Android on a phone. My first impression was, oh my gosh, this is just so quick. So whether I'm going through menus or I'm opening up applications, this has just got to be the fastest that I've seen it. I'm sure other phones come close to this, but there's just something about how zippy this feels. As for Jelly Bean features, the first thing I want to show you is the lock screen widgets, which are actually pretty awesome. The first one, if you go to the right, is the camera app. 
This is the only one that's not interchangeable, and I'll show you in a second. But you can see that you no longer have to unlock your phone to get to the camera application, which is especially nice because you don't have a dedicated camera button. If you scroll to the left of your default widget, you can see that I've got a couple other ones. You are limited to the amount that you can add. You can see this is your ad page here. I think it's about five pages. Once you hit your maximum, you can no longer hit the plus sign. They add a couple of default widgets. You can see this is what song is this, so you can search Google. If you immediately want to know what a song is, you can add your messaging so that you can easily access something like a text message and edit from there. You've actually got full access to Gmail, which is really nice. You just choose the account that you want, choose which box you want, which would be my inbox. And you can see here that it's actually fully accessible now and fully working. If you want to view a message, you just have to click on it like such and it brings you right to it and you can respond from there. You cannot respond on the actual widget itself. It's going to always open to the application. As you can see here, you can add third-party widgets as well to the home screen. This is Color Note, one of my favorite note-taking applications. And I was also able to add HD widgets for phones. So I can go under here, add something like weather. I am in Chambéry, France, which it's snowing right now. Just go ahead and click on that. Check. And voila! So if I want to have this as my main center, I just go over here, like so. And I can shove this guy out of the way. Your default is going to be to the far right, right before the camera application. So here we go, turn it off, turn it back on, and you can see there it is. If you want to have a full view, just go ahead and drop down. If you want to get into the application, you can just click on it from there. So I find that really nice and handy. One of the other things that I really like in Jelly Bean these days is expanded view. So you can see in my mailbox it says two messages. I can take it and actually spread it so I can see who they are from. If the notification has extra options, you can actually use those options straight from the box here. You've also now got access to your quick settings. So you just take two fingers, hold downward, and you can see there is the quick settings. If you want to see your notification bar, you just need to click on that and you're right back to the notification bar. You can also toggle right back to your quick settings. I don't believe that the quick settings are modifiable in any way. They just sit as is. So you've got access to settings, brightness. This is Google+. Plus. You can turn on and off your Wi-Fi. You can turn on and off your cell radio. Check your battery life. Turn it on airplane mode, Bluetooth, and you've also got access to your alarm clock from right here, which is actually quite handy. Another thing that I'm pretty much just now noticing is that they've added the date and the time up here in the notification bar. This was here before 4.2, I believe, but when you click on that, it takes you right into your date and time settings, so that's also handy. I'm really liking the ability to select the widgets that I want to go over to another page and to move it around, and you can see that all of the other widgets that are on here, or icons, will move around to accommodate the widget that I'm holding. Also, if I go to a page that has a bigger widget, it will actually resize this widget that I'm holding. I can see that it says February 10th there. You can see that it's ghosted in the background. I go ahead and drop that, and it resizes it for me. So that's really nice. You no longer have to mess around with things and to arrange your home screen. It smartly does it for you. For all you big texters and road warriors out there, there is something that I'm really liking that they've added to the AOSP keyboard. It was always a good keyboard as it is, great especially with auto correction. But now they've added swipes, we're going to do an example of that. Now one unfortunate thing that I must mention is if you're swiping long and hitting the space bar to get, of course, to another word, it's very easy to hit the software home button here as it's in very close proximity to the space bar. So sometimes you'll accidentally hit it and you'll throw yourself into a draft. I find that incredibly annoying and I'm not exactly sure what the solution for that is, but I just thought that that's kind of a quirk that you should be aware of. So let's now try for accuracy. So, hello there young child. I am here to inquire about your spoons. It's not quite right, but fairly accurate. Then we can try with just the keyboard, which I've always really loved. Now let's try with just the keyboard. It's a little bit difficult as I'm looking at it behind the camera, but let's see how I do. Hello there, young child. I am here to inquire about your spoons. Yeah, pretty accurate there. 
All of you are probably like, eh, you're a freak right now. You probably have no idea what it is that I'm referencing to Salad Fingers. It's kind of pre-YouTube flash videos. They then ended up putting it on YouTube called Fat Pie. You should really check it out. It's hilarious and very oddly creepy. So let's try out another means that you can use, which is incredibly accurate. You've got the voice recognition here, and I'm really impressed by this. So let's go ahead and try this as well. Hello there, young child. I am here to inquire about your spoons. Oh, spoons. And it's a... Uh, it keeps... Stop that! Stop. No. No, that's it. So you need to make sure that you hit tap to pause because it will just keep on going. Yeah, dictation. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers... There you go. Let's see how fast it can actually work on here. Hi, my name is Erica, and I like cheese, and I like tacos, and I like burritos, and I like iPads, and I like Apple stuff, and I like all technology, and Samsung, and Sony, and I don't know what else to say. And let's see how well this actually worked. So you can see that this is pretty accurate and crazy, especially because I was talking really fast. You've also got quick access to Google Now from anywhere along this bottom software button area here. You just need to go upward, and there you have it, Google Now. There is one slight thing that annoys me about it, though. <laughs> yep, -ba -ba. <laughs> oh yeah. What? You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me! So as you saw, something that I see as a major problem is that anytime you swipe upward from this software button bar, doesn't matter where you swipe upward from, you get immediately to Google+. It hasn't been disabled in any way, shape, or form, no matter what app you're in and no matter what you're doing, it seems to just screw you up. I noticed that when getting my groove on with Angry Grand Run, and it's... it's uh, why? They should at least let you disable this. I've seen some UI hacks that actually allow you to disable the software bar altogether and instead you use gestures to navigate around the operating system. That might actually be a solid solution because I find this a bit annoying sometimes. But nevertheless, I still find Google Now absolutely fabulous because it gives me a chance to see all my information on the go without me even asking it to. It tracks what I'm doing, which is a little bit scary, and it shows all the things that are nearby for photo spots. It's even got some dynamic cards that you can use in real time. You can see that this is currency conversion. It adds this automatically. It senses that I'm in a foreign country, which is France. So it says, okay, well, this is what it is for euros to dollars. If I want to enter in, just say 500 US dollars it automatically converts that for me so so awesome tells me the weather nearby attractions so this I've been finding kind of cool while I'm here in France there's actually a couple of things that they've improved upon let's get out of Google now either way we're going to be using Google search so from the main home screen we can use the search button call Domino's Pizza And it does it automatically, which is just really nice. Oop, let's stop that, as it's actually late at night. Now forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but I had noticed from before the newest update that when I would say call something, it would just give me a list of phone numbers in the search. It wouldn't actually call for me. So that seems to be something that's working now. I am so happy because this was a feature that I would use all the time. And it wasn't working for me for the longest time, but it now is. So whether this is an update or something that's been working the whole time, just know that you can do this so easily with Google search. Another thing that they've updated that I found incredibly annoying was when you wanted to make an appointment for the future on something like S Voice or even Siri, you could easily make an appointment for the future, but for some reason Google Now or Google Voice wasn't having any of it. It would tell you, sorry, but we can't make appointments for future dates. I was like, what are you talking about? That's just unacceptable. So they fixed it. So let me show you. Make an appointment for 5 p.m. tomorrow to eat burritos. 
So you can see it actually worked. It's now 11.44 p.m. and it's working for tomorrow, saying Monday. It's not telling me any longer, screw you. I don't wanna make future dates or appointments. So this is a plus. So now it's processor time. This phone is a beast with the specs that it has. It has the S4 Pro processor, that's the CPU, and for the GPU you have the Adreno 320, which is a really good GPU, especially for 3D graphics during gameplay. I wanna talk about some of the benchmarks that I'm finding and what other reviewers are finding. And there's something that people are noticing and something that I think should be brought to attention that other reviewers I haven't seen talking too much about is the CPU and GPU throttling. So basically that means that when the phone reaches a certain temperature, just say you're playing a game, the GPU speed will kind of start to drop when it gets to be a certain temperature. Same thing with the CPU. So that affects gameplay, whereas you're playing a really smooth game. Granny Smith is a really po fun, popular game that I play all the time. And I notice that it's going really smooth, but then all of a sudden you're gonna see sometimes a sudden drop in frame rates where it doesn't look so smooth. And that is the GPU throttling in action right there. So let's check out to see whether that's something that will really bother you or not. Alrighty, CPU. So you guys probably all know by now that this is sporting under its hood a Qualcomm S4 Snapdragon Pro processor. It is 1.5 gigahertz. It is quad core and it's also got two gigabytes of RAM. What does that all mean in the real world? Well, it means that Snapdragon S4 Pro quad core is actually very good in terms of a processor. It's in the Optimus G from LG and it's also in the Droid DNA by Motorola, which is on Verizon. And people are saying just how awesome it is, especially when it's been joined now with the new Adreno 320 GPU. Now we'll get into the GPU in a second. This guy has taken a major hit because of what I've been telling you about the processor throttling. So what's been happening is that when putting this guy through several benchmarks, it's shown to be much slower than the two phones I mentioned, the Optimus G and the Droid DNA. So people are like, oh no, this phone is horrible, blah, blah, blah. In the real world, it seems to be much different. Look at the thermal temperature of this phone right now. It's at 40.9 degrees Celsius. That's really hot. Also, this is the thermal temperature that Google has decided that will fully throttle this phone. So what I'm going to show you is with it fully throttled at this moment, what it does to the web speed or basically just scrolling around the phone, which is essentially nothing. And I'm going to show you why. And I'm also going to show you what's going on with the GPU when it's at full throttle as well. So you can see that it is still very snappy. We're gonna go ahead and load a web page. Let's do something like xdadevelopers.com, which is pretty intensive in terms of HTML and style sheets. And so let's go ahead and do this. You've got xdadevelopers.com loading. Taking a couple seconds there, and boom, done. Now keep in mind that it's still at 39.7 degrees Celsius, and it was very fast. Now that has a lot to do with the CPU speed at this moment, and just a little bit of GPU as well in terms of rendering, but you could see that it was very, very quick. What I want you to also keep in mind is that it has to do a lot with router speed as well, but just the basic idea is that the page rendering, even though this is at full throttle, doesn't seem to be affected really at all. The system is still incredibly snappy, and you can see that general daily use, even though this is at the throttle point, it's fine, honestly. To get the device to over 39 degrees Celsius, I was playing Need for Speed Most Wanted while holding it in front of pretty much a heat lamp. Of course, I paid attention to the real world aspect as well. In order to get it to throttle in the real world, I didn't use a heat lamp. I noticed that it first started to hit its throttle point at about 37 degrees. I did this by just looking at the battery meter here and also with CPU spy. So at about 15 minutes, it took to start throttling at 37 degrees Celsius. At about 30 minutes, it was at 39 degrees Celsius. Now keep in mind that this is in a room temperature type environment. So anywhere from 68 to 73 degrees. For me, it was about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. You need to adjust for Celsius, but that just lets you know that in an environment that's normal, that you're sitting in daily living in your home, it takes about a half hour playing something like NFS for 30 minutes to finally get it to be at full throttle. So that's a decent amount of time. It's not like it fully throttles at about five minutes or anything, but if you're a massive gamer who's playing for two or three hours, you're going to be in full throttle for much of the time. So keep that in mind. 
What we're going to do now is actually go ahead and take a look at the thermal configuration file for this device. So here is the FX. This is a file explorer. You need to have a rooted device in order to do and look at and edit what I am going to touch. Don't edit this file. I am going to show you. Don't do it. Don't do it. We go FX. We're going to go to System. We're going to go to Etc. Then we're going to scroll down. And you can see that there is a file called thermald.config. We're going to go ahead and open that up. Now I'm going to actually put this into a file editor so that we can see this in a better form. So now we are in thermald.config inside the text editor. What I must say, and this is why I was warning before, if inside the text editor you can edit anything in here and save it and the whole system will actually honor the changes that you've made. So if you don't know what you're doing, don't change this. I'm going to be showing you in thermal D all the way down at the bottom actually the lines of code here that have to do with the actual throttling of the device that Google has put in place. If you wanted to, you could take away all the thermal throttling by deleting bat underscore therm. Don't do this. There are several reasons I feel that Google has actually put this in place. A lot of it has to do, I think, with preserving battery life, because without that, I think the battery life would be trash. If you edit anything else, I feel that you could actually brick your device if the system honors it and you get some numbers wrong. So again, don't do this. Google has put bat.therm there for a reason. I do not think you should be editing this and taking away the throttling, or you could end up with many other problems with your phone, okay? Okay. So as I was showing you earlier under battery level, you can see it's now at 27.4 degrees Celsius. This area right here, bat.therm, actually is reading from the exact same sensor that's near or around the battery. And I actually want to explain what's going on in here so that you can understand why it's throttling and why CPU throttling isn't as bad as the GPU throttling, which we're really going to get into. I will show you with Need for Speed. That's one of my favorite games. So we're going to be looking at several lines here. We're going to be starting with thresholds and thresholds clear. So this is actually talking about temperature. So this is 36 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Celsius, 38 degrees Celsius, and 39 degrees Celsius. You're going further and further up inside this configuration file here. Don't mind that these numbers aren't as you would expect to see them. It's just how the system reads it. Below it says thresholds clear, which basically means if you hit 36 degrees Celsius, this whole line is going to apply until you go below 35 degrees Celsius. So this is the initialization of the threshold, and this is what ends up exiting out of this threshold. Then you see here, this is actions. We've got CPU, GPU, LCD, and battery. We're going to be talking about these a little bit later on, but you can see that they actually correspond downwards. So CPU, you've got 1.5 gigahertz. Again, don't mind what the form is. GPU, you've got a max of 400 megahertz LCD. This is actually going to be the backlight power. And battery, we're going to discuss later as well. So let's take a look at what's going on with the throttling here. Look at CPU. You can see that it says 1.5 gigahertz. Now you start getting some throttling at 37 degrees Celsius. Look, you can actually see a change here. It goes from 1.5 gigahertz down to 1.2 gigahertz. It stays 1.2 gigahertz at 38 degrees Celsius. And then when you hit 39 degrees Celsius, this line of code here automatically tells the phone to start doing full throttle. It drops the CPU frequency down to 1.1 gigahertz. You can see it stays 1.1 gigahertz all the way down through here. So when I said that the CPU throttling is not that bad, 1.1 gigahertz is not a bad speed at all. It's not a bad frequency. You can see that this is the lowest frequency that you're going to be getting. So in general use of the system, even if it's fully throttled, it's not much of a problem, not really at all. Anantic did some results, and I think it actually ends up looking at full throttle, something like the last generation processor, the S4, that was the dual core, not the S4 Pro. You see that like in the HTC One X or the American Galaxy S3. Keep in mind that this is the Qualcomm HTC One X and not the Tegra version. So again, CPU, it's really not a worry at all in general use, and that's how I know. But what you end up actually having trouble with is the GPU. This is something that I advise if you're somebody who plays hours and hours of gameplay, you might want to check out a different phone. 
but for someone like me who doesn't play for hours and hours, it should be fine. I was saying before that it took about a half hour to get to full throttle. I'm not going to be honestly playing games for more than a half hour, so that gives you an idea. And here is what's happening with the GPU. What you have here is it says 400 megahertz. That is a very nice GPU score. You can see that at 37 degrees Celsius, you start going down to 325 megahertz. It stays 325 megahertz at 38 degrees Celsius. Once you hit 39 degrees Celsius, you're getting 200 megahertz. Ouch. That means that you're staying at, once you hit 39 degrees, you are staying at half the frequency speed. So what does that mean? That means you're probably going to be getting half the frame rate. I don't want to freak anybody out. We're going to be doing a real test with Need for Speed when this is fully throttled so you can see what half frame rate looks like. For me, I'm not very sensitive to frame rates. It's still entirely playable. Probably people won't really notice. So that's why it's good to show you this and good to also show you the real world examples. So if you're somebody who's playing for like 15 minutes, you're probably going to be getting a little bit of throttling here. It's about 23% in frame rate drop, which is really not that bad. But if you're a heavy, 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 heavy gamer, you're going to be staying at 200 megahertz until you reach, this is why this is important, threshold clears, until your internal temperature drops below 36 degrees Celsius, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the full 400 megahertz again. That's why thresholds clear is important because it's telling you at what temperature you need the phone to be at in order to take advantage of the full speed. So full speed of this phone is at 36 degrees Celsius and below. Once you start getting above to 37 degrees, you start getting a little bit of throttling and you will not exit this command to throttle until you hit the clear. So keep in mind, in order to have full speed of this phone, you need to have it at below 36 degrees Celsius. So here we are at full throttle again. You can see that the battery temperature is 42.1 degrees Celsius. So we're going to be running Need for Speed Most Wanted. Now this is a game that I really like to play and I kind of chose this particular game because it's one that I have a hard time seeing at full frame. It's supposed to be playing at 30 frames per second, but I haven't really seen it reach that except for maybe on the iPhone, iPhone 5 actually. So you can see now with it fully throttled what it looks like dropping frame rates. Now don't bash my driving skills. But you can see here that it looks fairly smooth. I know that I'm dropping several frames here. So with the GPU throttling, you're probably dropping anywhere from about half frames per second. It can be less than that. At some points I can see that I'm almost hitting 30 frames per second. It's doing a pretty good job overall. But in some places it kind of just looks choppy. Whoa, take down. So I think that the biggest problem is just the stuttering that you can see with the frame rates. But again, if you're someone who's not all that sensitive to frame rates dropping, you're probably going to be feeling just fine with this. It is still entirely playable, but it's just not as pretty as it could be. Oh, there you can see that there was some nice frame drops there. Get out of my way! So now let's get into antennas, let's get into call quality, let's get into all those things that keep you connected. Alrighty, so Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS. Starting with the Wi-Fi, I found it to be quite strong. I haven't had any issues with using it or connecting, nothing like that. You've got the GPS and that's been fairly awesome as well. Haven't had any problems there. And Bluetooth was something to be actually desired. With the 4.2.2 update, I've noticed that there's been a lot of improvements with the Bluetooth. What was happening with 4.2.1 was that there was discrepancies going on. If you had the Wi-Fi on and the Bluetooth, you wouldn't be able to use both at the same time. The Bluetooth would start breaking up and sounding weird. I'd have times where I couldn't get the Bluetooth to connect to something like a Bluetooth speaker at all. That was frustrating. But with 4.2.2, that seems to be much better and I haven't had any trouble transferring files back and forth with OBEX, so it seems to be solved for the most part. If there's anyone else having issues, just comment down below. I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. 
Now, as for call quality, upon initial release of this phone, I heard people complaining that there was a lot of trouble with the call quality. They'd be listening to a voice through the receiver end right here, and they would hear crackling or they would hear buzzing or other weird frequencies that shouldn't be there. With mine, I haven't had any issues with it. Once in a while, if you're in a pin drop quiet room, you'll hear just a little bit of white noise or a tad bit of a buzz or some type of sound distortion. But honestly, it's not bad at all. Voices sound pretty clear. It's what you can expect from like a landline. It's not absolutely pristine like you can hear from Wi-Fi over Skype, but it's okay. It's actually the speaker phone that leaves something to be desired. Actually, really, it's the speaker in general. For me, it's just too quiet. When I'm trying to use it as a speaker phone, if I'm in the car or anywhere where there's any other noise, it gets hard to hear it. It's also kind of muffled sounding, not very nice at all. It becomes increasingly difficult to use it for GPS because there's a lot of noise when you're in a car and it's very hard to hear it that way as well. So not the greatest speaker on here, it'll do. Another thing that kind of bothers me is the placement and also the shape of it. So when you hold it in your hand, it seems that if you're listening to music, it can become kind of easy sometimes to cover it up. So then you're just muting it almost entirely. Now as for speed tests, I've actually been fairly impressed with this. It's got a dual carrier modem in it, which is just as fast as what we have on the Galaxy Note 2, which also has the exact same modem, and it's the same exact modem also in the iPhone 5. So you're gonna get really good data speeds, even though this isn't a 4G phone. That's also something that I want to mention these days, is that this did have an unsupported 4G LTE ban that was never passed by the FCC. In the 4.2.2 update, they took it away it did work in Canada on the AWS band as well as in the United States on AT&T in some strange areas that had the 1700 band. But it is no more unless you want to hack it and get to it. But uh, it wasn't actually legal in the first place as per FCC, so it's gone. But uh, you can go ahead and check out the speed test on dual carrier HSPA+. Plus. That just means that instead of taking down from one cell tower, it's taking bandwidth down from two cell towers at one time and combining it together to make it very fast. So in the United States, if you use this on T-Mobile, you'll get very fast speeds that looks a lot like 4G. AT&T sadly never enabled their dual carrier ability, which is quite frustrating, so don't expect to get any faster than just normal HSPA Plus speeds on AT&T. In Europe, a lot of the carriers have dual carrier. For example, I have a European SIM card. This is a French SIM card. We're going to go ahead and do a speed test. We're going to say, begin test. So you can see there, not too bad for download. It's 13.22 megabits per second. That's what you can be expecting. For upload, it's capped at just one megabit per second, which is common, but very nice. Honestly, very nice. Kind of comparable to low end 4G speeds, but still incredibly fast. A lot faster what you're going to be seeing with HSPA+. And with the Note 2 getting about the same scores, you can see that this is quite a reliable data device. Whee! Camera time! Let's get into cameras. That is probably my favorite feature of a smartphone and one of those features that is very important to me. And the specs are also very important to me and performance is incredibly important to me. So let's go and test out the camera. I'm gonna show you some photospheres. I'm gonna show you some video quality. I'm gonna show you tons of pictures. It's gonna be pretty awesome. And you can decide for yourself what you exactly think of this. So we're out in France in the mountains. It's called La Fécla. La Fécla? Yeah. La Fécla. Yeah. La Fécla. I'm not very good with French at all. So what we're actually going to do right now is to take the Nexus 4 and try out Photosphere. Francois came out with a good way to actually do it so it's very quick and also very accurate so you don't get a lot of weird type of artifacts in the image. So what I'm going to show you right now is a nice dizzying effect. If you get motion sickness this might not be the best way for you to make a Photosphere but this is probably the best way. So what you need to do is actually keep your arms close to your body. You want to hold it up and it's going to say align to start. Now the idea is to move around the camera so that you're only pivoting your hand up and down. What you don't want to do is start moving your arms up and down like this because then you will definitely be getting some artifacts. So what we're going to do is stay in this exact same circle plane. We're going to go around like a globe and complete this pretty much middle top to bottom. Since it's also bright out here, we're going to be able to do this very quickly around in a circle. If it were darker, the exposure time, you know, it would take a lot longer to end up taking a picture. So, here we go. <sighs> All right. Start turning around, making as little arm, arm movement as possible. 
returning to my reference point and my cameraman. Yes, you're going to be seeing the cameraman here. Pivot your hand upward like this and complete the circle. You can see the little blue dots are following around perfectly. And again, pivot upward. And circle. What's also nice is because I'm pivoting this way, I'm not going to be seeing any holes in the image. Take it, pivot downward. Start completing the lower part of your sphere. Pivot again. And what's nice is that since I'm moving around the camera, I shouldn't be getting my feet in the shot. It's very little at all. So, I'm going to go ahead and hit stop. I don't know how well this turned out, but we're going to hit stop. You can see that uh, it is now rendering here. And hopefully, when it's done, it will be able to render everything together so that all the planes are correct and you don't see any type of weird artifacts. It takes a few minutes. Okay, so, oh, look at this. Oh, that looks perfect, perfecto. So we're just gonna start viewing it. Now you can see that uh, the lines are actually pretty lined up here. Here's our cameraman. He looks pretty good. I'm going to start scrolling around. You've got some skiers there. You can see that all the planes have actually nicely lined up. Google's done a very good job with the software on this. You can see the sky. And you can see the ground. So everything actually looks quite nice. And then all you need to do is tap it. And it will start auto panning by itself. So you can see your whole beautiful image actually worked out quite well. So this is where I am right now! Whee! It worked! It worked very well! I am so happy with the result. Can we go get a hamburger? Yes! <laughs> Can we get a hamburger? <laughs> oh, hot dog, yeah. Now before I forget, I want to show you a feature that's called Tiny Planet. A lot of people were asking me how I had done this. After you've made your photosphere, go ahead and click on your photosphere. You can see that you got three choices here. You can edit the image. You can also pick this one that looks kind of like a world with trees and towers. Let's go ahead and click on that guy. And this is how you make your tiny planet. The first thing you can do is choose the rotation or the orientation of the image. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it in the way that I enjoy most, where Mr. Francois here is facing straight upward on his little mound of ice. Kind of looks like an ice cream cone people pointed out to me yesterday. You can also decide the size that you want, so we're going to go ahead and drag this. You can see you can make it bigger, really big, and see all the details that you'd like. Or if you'd like to zoom out, you can see the full picture of what you were looking at. So I like this. This looks pretty cool. So you go ahead and you say, apply tiny planet, saving to camera. Now, if you'd like to, you can edit it afterwards. It looks so awesome. Looks like total atmosphere and sky with trees. Go ahead and pick it. You can see you can add all kinds of cool effects. We've got punch, we've got vintage, we've got black and white, we've got bleach, we've got everything that you can possibly think of. You can put it in some type of framing like so. You can also crop it and rotate it. You can go ahead and add a variety of other settings. Let's go ahead and pick curves. You can mess around with your gamma. Ooh. Wee. Let's make a crazy burn effect. Now it's on fire. So apply curves. Change the framing again. Ha ha. Check that out. I like it. Go ahead and save it now. Save! And there you have it. On top of ice cream, the world is on fire. Whee! Okay, cool. Getting into the camera interface, there are a lot of interesting settings, like I showed you with the Photosphere just a moment ago. That's probably the coolest thing with this phone right now. The thing is, it's not going to stay exclusive to this phone, so you can expect to see Photosphere on other Jelly Bean phones in the future. But right now, this is the only phone that has it, and I think that is so cool. You can access Photosphere or other modes by clicking on the camera button down here. There's Photosphere, there's Panorama, you've got video camera, and you can also take pictures of cars. I find Google's design implementation kind of interesting. You no longer have to go through menus. You can just go ahead and click down and make all the adjustments right here and there. I find that really fun. It's kind of gimmicky, neat to play with. 
One of my concerns is that you can touch it anywhere. So you can see that the UI for the camera menu is now off the screen. It uh, really should not be something that's an option. So I find that a little bit curious. So from the touch UI, you have access to HDR, which is a really good feature to have. You've got your flash. You've got the ability to turn the camera and look at yourself with a front facing camera. You've got exposure. You've got a quick settings tab here, which you can use to select scene mode, your location, or the type of picture size. This is the max, eight megapixels. You've also got access there to white balance. One thing that I hope that they really improve, this is not something that's a knock on the Nexus 4, but rather the software itself, is that it seems to be zoomed in a little bit, so that when you take a picture, I can't ever tell if it's in focus. Even if it's in focus, the preview seems to be a little bit blurry, so I can't tell sometimes if I'm focusing correctly or not. And I'm going to show you several pictures so that you can see what it is that I am talking about. So this is a pretty good first example. I relied on the viewfinder to tell me that this was indeed in focus and ready to go. It turned green on the little focus ring. I pushed the camera button and as you can see, it's certainly not in focus. So really relying on the camera focus sometimes is just, it's just not practical. You have to look at every single picture sometimes. After several shots, I was finally able to get a good result. You can see that even though this is a macro shot, it did pretty well when it was able to focus. But again, I had to go into the gallery and make sure that it came out how it, I wanted it to. When you're outside in a condition where it becomes hard to see the screen, this becomes especially unfortunate because this entire picture would have been really nice if it was just in focus. Nothing is in focus. Look at the hotels there. The whole picture just looks grainy and absolutely terrible. One thing that I find entirely laughable about when taking pictures is how to get to the gallery to actually view the picture that you took. So we're going to try to get this to focus, which is another gripe of mine because it seems it only keeps focus for a couple of seconds until you can see that, look at that, it just keeps bouncing focus. Just lock focus, man. Stay there. Stop moving. So let's take a picture. So I've taken the picture. As you can see, it's gone to the side. Now, they don't tell you how to navigate this UI. Watch this. In order to get to the gallery, there is no menu button to push. You're like, what the, what am I doing? So in order to get to it, you need to actually take your thumb, place it down and flick. Oh, actually that was exactly what I was gonna try to show you. Did you see that when I put my thumb down there that I accidentally initiated the UI to change a setting? Check that out. If you don't flick it fast enough, you won't be able to get to your gallery, which you have no idea where it exists in the first place. So if you hold your finger down just for a millisecond too long, you end up activating the camera settings. So I imagine people who have motor problems, or people if just it's really cold outside and you can't move your finger fast enough, instead of flicking to look at the picture you took, you might end up turning on some type of setting like HDR. You won't know it's on HDR if you don't pay attention. So the next time you go to take a picture, it just sits there. You're like, what, why, what is it doing? Oh, crap. That was HDR, wasn't it? And then your picture looks like poo. So interesting, interesting UI there, Google. You should probably fix this. Hmm. With the touch settings during video, you can turn the camera on yourself to use the front facing camera. You can turn on and off a flash, which is nice because it actually has a video light flash. See that now the video light flash is on and very, very bright. So that will work excellently if you need to use it during the nighttime to film something. You've got access here to your white balance and you've also got a quick settings tab. You've got a cool time lapse feature. Choose your video quality and you can also choose your location. Let's go probe and play with it more with all the pictures and videos that I've taken so I can point things out to you so you can decide if this is the phone you want, just because of the camera, I know some people are like that, so let's go and play with it. Starting off with low lighting, the Nexus 4 does pretty okay. I don't see a huge amount of noise in this image. Even though it's not sharp, it does hold a lot of detail, so it, it does pretty well. Moving forward, we have several images with and without flash. I think it does quite a bit better with flash, obviously, because you're getting more light and therefore more detail. There are some instances where the white balance is influenced by the flash. You can see that with the horrible red that you're seeing here in this image. Next is actually without flash. It has quite a bit of detail, surprisingly, even though we're in low lighting, and it still looks relatively sharp. 
I find myself surprised by the results of this camera sometimes. Sometimes it looks completely awful and you're like, oh my goodness. And sometimes it looks quite all right. Like with the HDR setting here, that looks quite nice. You have three different exposures mixed here to give a nice range of different tones from dark to light. So pretty, pretty okay. Just depending, sometimes good, sometimes not. By itself, for the most part, I feel like the Nexus 4 is able to take quite nice pictures with a lot of detail and color that is fairly accurate and appealing to exactly what we're looking at. Look at all these chocolates. Don't those look delicious? At best, I usually find its HDR setting kind of wonky. They do things that are not quite right with the colors. You can see some of the chocolates look a little bit burned and losing detail. When taking pictures with sky in the background, I usually like to use the HDR setting because it allows you to capture the clouds and the color of the sky instead of just being completely overexposed in the sky and just seeing the object that's in the foreground. But you can see that the HDR in here, the pink color on the house is just incredibly unnatural. They're really oversaturating certain colors here. Here we have the same exact image with the Galaxy Note 2 and you can see you can still see the sky, but the building is actually of its natural color. It doesn't overcompensate. My point is with this camera is that sometimes it just does weird things. This is without the HDR and it's, this is not what it looked like at all actually. And even though I find the HDR to be really wonky, I ended up having to use the HDR setting to get what would look like a natural image. There you go. That looks more like what I was actually looking like when I was at this certain place here. So the camera is good. I think it has a lot of potential. Honestly, on a day-to-day -day basis, this would not be the camera phone that I would choose to take with me to catch that perfect shot. It's just way too unpredictable. I never know if a shot is actually going to be in focus, so that ends up being a major pain. Also, I never know what's going to be going on with the white balance, if it's actually going to expose correctly. So it's, it's a real hassle. HDR works sometimes, sometimes it's just too much. So I, it's really not the solid choice for those who really want to rely on their camera phone. Not to mention, if you hate the dreaded pink spot that's among whites and other solid colors, then you probably don't want to be using this phone either. Probably the most annoying thing about the camera is that even in perfect day lighting, sometimes pictures just don't look right, especially when there's not a lot of contrast, like in this picture right here. Even in perfect daylight, they're adding a lot of smoothing to try to create a noise reduction, an aggressive noise reduction. Normally this is okay when you're in a dark environment and you're trying to get rid of noise, you kind of smooth out the speckles and the noise that you see, but in this case, there's perfect daylighting and they are smoothing out the details that you're seeing and then on top of it they're adding sharpening. So you're adding sharpening to non-detail and you end up getting speckles and it looks wrong and I just wish this would look a lot nicer because this was a really pretty picture. This is low lighting using the Nexus 4 camera, staring at a bunch of graffiti on a wall. Yeah. Can it focus? Oh, it stopped it by touching it. Oh no, it took a picture. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious intelligence for humans right there. This here is the epitome of human intelligence. Look at that nice dent in the railing. Car went right into it. Hey, what are you doing? Can you hear the water? It's so pretty. Check this out. People get married in this place right here. Oh. Pretty. Life makes the world go round. Ooh. So battery life is like the bane now of human existence. If battery life is bad on your phone, 
kind of screwed and one of the major things with this particular phone is that the battery is not user replaceable. Now you can take this phone apart and I've seen a take apart guide of this particular phone. It looks like the battery is not too hard to actually release from the motherboard. It just has a ribbon cable connector. You can pop that up and then it is actually stuck quite well inside the phone, inside the internal chassis of the phone with a really nice adhesive. So if you are not faint of heart, uh, you can go ahead and try to replace that battery yourself. But if you're not, you need to really pay attention to battery life on this guy because it's really not so good. So with battery life, I really am not that impressed. The battery in this phone is 2,100 milliamp hours. What I'm showing here is actually 3 hours and 5 minutes and 7 seconds of screen time. is at 15% right now. Going over here, you can see that the phone was active for 6 hours, 48 minutes, and 38 seconds. So this is probably what a realistic day is going to look like if you're somebody who's watching a lot of movies, you're browsing the internet, you're using your phone constantly. That's kind of bad. So you're getting about 3 hours and 30 minutes of screen time once this hits about 0%. And you can see that you're going to be needing to charge this phone at least one time through the day if you're a heavy user. There's no other way to cut it. It makes me very, very sad, but this is true. Now here we have another example for a person who's not using their phone for intensive media experience all throughout the day, but rather just checking Gmail or browsing the web. You can see that it was able to last me for 16 hours and 22 minutes, 24 seconds. It's still got 23%. So that means that I would have gotten over three hours of screen time. So you can get fully through the day with this, but again, if you're somebody who is a power user, you're going to need to charge this at least one time through the day. So the fact that we keep making more and more powerful phones without the ability to really last through the day is both horrifying me and disturbing me in a way that I just, I am about to give up on cell phones. Well, not really, but I think that there is actually one solution right now, and that would be to include a battery about this size. Now, I'm not trying to be a Samsung fanboy in any way, shape, or form, but what you can see here is this is the Galaxy Note 2 battery. It's 3100 milliamp hours versus the 2100 milliamp hour battery in this power horse right here. That's over 32% more battery life. So until we start making phones that are more efficient in terms of using power, I think that they should start including bigger batteries. It's kind of like, duh, but we're so hung up on keeping phones so thin that we're not doing this. So Google is probably doing one of two things. They are throttling the phone in order to keep the phone from not dying in two hours. And also I've seen inside the phone, there is no heat sink to disperse the heat away from the battery. So maybe Google is afraid that the battery will get fried because you have the SOC that's pretty much right next to the battery. And it's actually kind of funny because the one sensor that they are using in order to throttle the phone is actually the battery heat sensor. Another thing is that's funny is that they have this phone where if you're using it for a long period of time, you're playing games, you're having a great time, when you have it plugged in, the battery charging rate is also throttled. So that means if you are feeling like you should plug your phone in while you play games for two hours, and oh yeah, it'll charge, nah, -uh. no it won't. At 39 degrees, you're actually starting to throttle the speed in which your battery charges. And as the phone just keeps heating up because you're using it for two hours, the charging speed is gonna go down, 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 down. Ooh, I didn't get to finish telling you the story that I had with the Nexus 4 here. Actually, you know, I really enjoyed my time with the Nexus 4. I had my ups and my definite downs with this phone, but it was overall a really nice phone. The only thing is that I won't be using it anymore and it's going to be sitting in a drawer collecting dust. So I feel that it deserves a much better home than that, especially as I move on to the ether of a plethora of smartphones. So what I'm going to be doing is taking this guy here and putting it on eBay. It's in awesome condition. I keep all my things in really good condition. So if you want a 16 gigabyte Nexus 4, it will be up in on these dates for your consideration. You can bid on it and hopefully it's yours. When I first thought about the idea of putting it on eBay, I was told by some people that, yeah, you should totally sign it. So I think that's really odd that anyone would want me to sign it, but if you do, I will totally do that as well. And it will be like Erica technology nerd phone and all that good stuff. So yes, 
What I'm saying is it's only going to be available for a week. I just know that I'm going to be spammed like a year from now of people saying, oh, I want the phone. Is it still available? No, it won't be still available. It's available on these dates down here. I'm sure once this video is released, it will already be up. I will save the dates on Facebook and on Twitter. So please don't spam me. So thank you everyone so much for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can be my friend on Facebook, but this is going to be just for a limited time as I'm trying to change people to followers because Mark Zuckerberg does not let people have more than 5,000 friends. I don't know, maybe he's just against people having fun and mingling and talking on what he calls a social site. But anyway, I don't need you, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm making my own website anyway. But for right now, I use Facebook more like a forum and update page. And you can go on there anytime that you'd like and see what's going on. You can ask me questions and I get, try to get back to you as soon as possible. One thing I have to recommend is not going to the personal message box because I don't usually answer those. It ends up filling up and it looks like spam and I don't have time to look at it. So if you put it on the wall, a lot of people can take a look at it. They can answer your question if I don't have time to. So Facebook has been awesome before my actual website goes up and I will be deciding when exactly that will be. But hopefully it will be sometime in this early future. You can also follow me on Twitter and you can also add me on Google+. Plus. So please do those things if you want to interact with me. I love interacting with you guys and it's just probably one of the most awesome things in the world, genuinely. I sound like such a sap, but really, it means a lot to me to interact with you all. So I really hope that I've helped you decide if this is the right phone for you. What it comes down to is that this is a phone that has the right price, the right specs. It's going to be pleasing for a lot of people, but it does have some issues that if you watch this video and you decide that you don't really like those issues, I would probably go and find another phone. So at the right price point, great specs, but has some issues that you may not be able to overlook. So this guy is probably on eBay now. Go check the description and I shall see you all in a future video. Good night.